Hello and welcome to the Spinal Cord Injury Forum. My name is Jeannie Hoffman. I'm a clinical psychologist and the director of the Northwest Regional Spinal Cord Injury System here at the University of Washington. Tonight we are very pleased to have two UW faculty members who will be discussing probiotics, um, what they are, how they affect our health, and what the research says about probiotics and spinal cord injury. Our first speaker tonight is Dr. William DiPaolo, Associate Professor of Medicine and the Director of the Center for Microbiome Sciences and Therapeutics. And he'll be followed by Dr. Rena Reyes, Associate Professor of Rehabilitation Medicine here and a spinal cord injury physician at the VA Puget Sound Healthcare System. So please join in welcoming, welcoming Dr. DiPaolo. So thank you for having me tonight um, <clears throat> talk about uh, probiotics. It's a, um, a topic that many people have questions about. It's a topic that, you know, can affect many people. And right now the research has shown that it can impact multiple diseases, maybe for the good or maybe for the bad. So I'm going to take you through sort of a lesson on probiotics, which I'm calling Probiotics 101, to, um, to help answer these questions and to educate you a little bit about what these um, beneficial bacteria do for us. So what is a probiotic? Now this is actually a definition that the World Health Organization has come up with in 2002 that is still actually pertinent or relevant today, which is very vague. It's um, live microorganisms which, when administered in adequate amounts, confer a health benefit on the host. So this is the World Health Organization talking about um, these probiotics and, and it doesn't really tell you what they are, it doesn't tell you what you should do with them, how you should take them, or how many, how many you should take. And that's basically the, where we live in still today and with probiotics and the research out there. Um, there was a really a big bust of probiotic research back in the 90s and uh, a lot of clinical trials had started using different probiotics and what ended up happening was people, researchers and clinicians couldn't they didn't use the same type of probiotic, they didn't use the same dose, they didn't use the same route of administration. And so what ended up happening was these clinical trials were had very distinct or very different results. Um, some worked, some didn't, but nobody could actually translate across the board. And so probiotics kind of died away and, and did that sort of crash of death that you don't want something you study to crash because <laughs> there goes the funding on that. But all of a sudden with the advent of the microbiome, and our gut bacteria and people paying attention to that, a new face has sort of emerged with probiotics and a new interest uh, has uh, sort of begun with them. And so um, it's been interesting to see a sort of revival of this topic in science. So there's a couple of definitions that I'll take you through. And again, also please stop me if um, I go down a road that is confusing. I'm a talker and so I just ramble sometimes and get on my own sort of, uh, topic conversation with myself. Um, but if you don't understand something or you can't hear me, interrupt me. And I don't mind taking questions in the middle of my talk. So a probiotic, again, we just went over this, is a live microorganism administered in adequate amounts that confers a health benefit. Uh, prebiotics are basically non-digestible products that promote the health of, uh, promote the growth of healthy gut bacteria. And a new term that's being thrown around is a symbiotic. And this is a product that contains both a prebiotic and a probiotic. And so by the end of this talk, I hope that you'll be able to explain all of these things to your neighbors and your friends and family. <laughs> so um, I always like to do a brief history of, for any talk that I give, um, just because I think it's fun. And I like to learn about this stuff. So um, at the, so the Bible actually, probiotics go all the way back to the Bible, if you can believe it. Um, the Bible states that Abraham owed his longevity to the consumption of sour milk. And that sour milk is, uh, soured due to those bacteria that are in it. And this is very similar to something we might be drinking today called kefir, which is uh, fermented uh, uh, milk that um, contains uh, healthy gut bacteria or healthy probiotic bacteria. So then um, we move forward to 76 BC, which was the Roman historian Pl Plinus re recommended the administration of fermented milk products to treat gastroenteritis. So this is in 76 BC, the Romans were actually already doing what we're still doing today <laughs> and, and treating um, people who have uh, probably infectious diarrhea with uh, fermented milk products to combat that uh, infection. And so then in 1857, we were, uh, 
at the Pasteur Institute, they discovered lactobacillus, and lactobacillus is a very common probiotic. You probably have heard it or read it on the uh, side of a yogurt or kefir uh, label. So lactobacillus, we'll talk a lot about lactobacillus as sort of the model organism of probiotics, but this was discovered in 1857. So 76 BC to 1857 is a long time for them not to have discovered this, but that's when they did. And then um, in 1907, this is a great story. I love this story. So Mechnikov um, was a Bulgarian who, uh, scientist who proposed that this acid that produced, uh, was produced by bacteria in fermented milk consumed regularly led to a longer, healthier life. And he, there was a town that he went to that he said had beautiful women. And they all drank this fermented milk. And, and so he would go there and he would drink it. And he lived quite a long life himself. But I think he just liked to go there to flirt with these women that were so beautiful. Um, and actually, um, I think he had a, uh, this bacteria was uh, isolated and called um, uh, L um, Bul Bulgaris or uh, for Bulgaria. So, um, and then in early 1930s in Japan, they developed a fermented milk product called Yakult, which is a uh, predecessor to the yogurt and kefirs that we're drinking today. And then in 1965, New York really still well coined the term probiotic. So that's a very new term. It's only been around since 1965, which uh, is, again, quite interesting since it's been all the way, they've been using it since the biblical times. So um, where do probiotics come from and what is a probiotic? So probiotics are actually found um, naturally in some of our foods that we ingest. So this is, like I've said already, yogurt. Kefir, which is a bit like yogurt, but it's more of a drinkable consistency, a little bit of a sour taste, and there's actually bubbles in it. They call it the champagne of yogurt because of the bubbles uh, produced from the bacteria fermenting it. Um, and so I drink a lot of kefir, and I love when I find a good one that has the bubbles in it because I'm thinking about the bacteria making those bubbles, but um, it also is a nice consistency. Um, natto is uh, something prepared with uh, soybeans, and it's fermented. And it contains a lot of bacteria called bacillus. And it's also got a lot of fiber and a lot of um, prebiotics that that means. And we'll come back to talk about that. But probiotics are really actually members of a group of bacteria that do reside within our intestines. So they don't just naturally reside in these food products. They're actually also resident within our own bodies and our own intestines. And this consortia of bacteria, the whole gamish that's in our intestines, is called the microbiota. And so again, scientists love to make terms that sound the same but mean very different things. And so um, there's a difference between microbiota and what you hear about as the microbiome. So the microbiota refers to the actual bugs that reside within and on us. So you have a microbiota of your skin, your microbiota in your nostrils, and your oral cavity, and your lungs, and your intestines. And this is referring mostly to bacteria. So when you read something about microbiota, it's really the bugs themselves. Whereas when people talk about the microbiome, the biome is basically every bug, all of their genes, and everything that they produce. So it encompasses not just the, the bacteria itself, but also all of its genetic material. Um, this also includes fungus, because you do have fungus and yeast that reside in your intestine, and also viruses, because we all also have viruses that live there as well. So there's this huge consortia of um, bacteria, which is con uh, composed of 100 trillion bacteria within our gastrointestinal tract. So that's 10 to the 14th. This means that we have a one-to-one -one ratio of our own human cells to the bacteria that live within us. So we're equally made up of bacteria as we are our own human cells. And if you think about the genetic material that these bacteria contain, it's 100 to 300 bacterial genes for every single one of our genes, which means we have more genetic material inside of us that's not us. Um, than we do our own, back, uh, our own human genes. And so if you think about all of the, if you consider all of these bacteria, viruses, fungi, as well as all of the genes that they have, it's no wonder people are interested in the microbiome. And actually, I've even heard us referred to as just walking sacks of bacteria, because they are now linked to almost every function that you can imagine. Um, but the microbiome is, and you can't turn on the radio or the TV without hearing something about the microbiome. It's been on NPR. There's the microbiome diet that people are now promoting out there. And so it's a really, I've never been or I've never seen a topic in science catapult as to sort of rock star status like the microbiome has. But um, it has. And so now 
we're hoping that educating people of what the microbiome is will help get good, um, would help have a good resource for people. So this is just a quick um, picture just to show you that even though we have all these bacteria, they're very distinct for the different sites of our body. That means that the bacteria that are in your stomach are not the same bacteria that are resident in your small intestine, and they're not the same that's resident in your colon. If you think about all of the functions that your stomach has that are different from your small intestine, and all the differences between your small intestine function and colon function, they, and, and even just the environment, these bacteria are very specialized in helping those organs do their job. <clears throat> so <clears throat> in um, the colon, you have a lot of bacteria that are uh, for fermenting or for breaking down fiber and starch, and these are listed over here in the colon on the other side, like Bacteroides, Bifidobacterium, and Enterobacteriaceae. So <clears throat> not only are we, do we have 10 to the 14th different bacteria, they're also very specialized in where they live within us. And this is just our intestines. I mean, we have, like I said, an oral microbiome, a skin microbiome, um, a genital tract microbiome. Every part of our body is covered in bacteria. So go home at night and think about that when you lie in your sheets. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> so like any population or any community, you have good, pe good bacteria and bad bacteria. And so even our intestines have good bacteria that promote health, but we do have bacteria in there that might be considered not so good. Um, and so the good bacteria are ones you've probably heard of, like bifidobacteria, uh, lactobacilli are sort of traditional probiotics or good bacteria. Um, even E. coli, so E. coli gets a really bad rap because you're always hearing about people eating at um, a fast food chain or something or a Taco Bell and they end up having an E. coli infection and, and a really bad gastroenteritis from that exposure. I think right now there's something with romaine lettuce going around. Um, and so E. coli is a cause for that, but there's also probiotic E. coli's that re reside within our guts. And so it's not necessarily a bad thing that the E. coli exists. It just depends the type of E. coli and where you find it. Um, other examples of bad bacteria are Campylobacteria, um, and the one that you might be most familiar with is C. difficile or Clostridium difficile. Now, Clostridium difficile is an interesting bug because it is re resident in most people. It's only under certain conditions that um, allow for it to sort of blossom and to take over the intestine and cause very, very bad, sometimes fatal disease. And this is when patients undergo um, antibiotic treatment. So what happens is you wipe out all of your bacteria, so you take away all your good bacteria, and then C. diff is still there, and in some people, we don't know why, it just grows, and it grows out of control. And so we'll talk about how fecal transplants are very useful in combating C. diff infection, um, but that's a bacteria that is present in all of us. Actually, I did a BuzzFeed video where we looked at um, what bacteria people have on their cell phones, and one of the people had C. diff on their cell phone. And when BuzzFeed wanted the, the plates back, um, and I couldn't give it to them because it was a biohazard. So, I said, <laughs> But you should have seen the look on the poor guy's face when I told him he had C. diff on his cell phone. <laughs> so it is resident, and that's why we have to wash our hands all the time and be careful where we set our phones or bring our phones. Um, so this consortia of bacteria in our intestines, what does it do? What, why is it helpful and why do we have it? So um, it's been shown that these bacteria um, produce or boost our immune system. So 90% of your immune system is actually in the tissue of your gut, um, in the wall of the intestine. This, uh, and the very specialized immune cells that function to keep that gut healthy. It also um, maintains an acidic pH, which is good for the immune system, and it produces factors that prevent infection. So it helps to induce mucus. And don't get me started on, I love mucus. It's like the best conversation ever. Um, we produce more mucus in one day. You can cover a whole football field with it from one person. Um, so I, I'm a good, I have all these facts. It's great. Um, I can entertain any dinner party. It, so, so um, it also supports healthy weight. So we have bacteria inside of us that produce chemicals that promote satiety. So it's kind of help you realize, hey, I'm full, stop eating. Um, it's been shown now that they help um, improve mental health. 90% um, of your body's serotonin, that feel good um, neurotransmitter is made in your intestines. It's your gut bacteria that actually synthesize serotonin. And so then, if you think about when your gut's out of whack, sometimes you get depressed or foggy-headed, it's no wonder if the 95% or 90% of your serotonin is coming from your intestines. 
Um, it's been shown to um, increase energy levels through that absorption of nutrients, as well as promoting cardiovascular health and uh, regulating hormones. So basically, everything you can think of, the microbiome has <laughs> an impact on. So how does this microbiome, how do you get it? How can you change it? What does it mean? And, and all these big existential questions, I guess. So we are born with our microbiome. And actually, the way you're born imprints your microbiome. So if you're born through a cesarean section versus a vaginal birth, you have completely different microbiomes. So your if a vaginal birth colonizes the infant with lactobacilli from the vaginal walls. So you have this sort of probiotic beneficial um, uh, microbiome that's transmitted to the child. Uh, cesarean section, you're colonized with skin bacteria. So that's the first bacteria the baby's exposed to because inside the womb, it's sterile. And so those children have, at the beginning of their lives, have a skin microbiome filled with streptococcus and peptococcus and all these other coccuses, I guess. Um, and so research has shown that th that difference in the microbiome leads to sometimes allergy. Uh, kids with uh, born cesarean section have tend to have, are more prone to infection. They're also more prone to allergy later in life. It doesn't necessarily mean you, if you gave a cesarean sec or had a cesarean section, it doesn't doom your children to, to this. But it's just that research has shown they tend to be a little bit more susceptible to um, having these um, uh, allergies and, and infections. Um, but it's not the end of the world because once they start solid food, or actually, so if you breastfeed or um, formula feed, that also t changes the microbiome. So as you can imagine, uh, breastfeeding is the ideal situation where you can not only um, ingest uh, really good immune components like antibody from your mother's milk, but there's also that helps potentiate really good strong bifidobacterium and probiotic bacteria in the infant. Whereas formula fed does not have those same nutrients, so you don't have that sort of feeding of the really um, of the probiotic bacteria. Um, the switch, the big change happens when uh, you switch over to solid foods. So of course, uh, the type of food you expose your children to is going to then shape and change the microbiome very dramatically in these children. So you have sort of a uh, infant microbiome, and then when they start solid foods, there's a huge shift. And then um, there's hormonal and pubertal changes, as well as when you're a teenager and your diet kind of is crappy, or you're in college and you're eating junk food to stay awake. Um, you have this sort of last um, change in your microbiome, and then pretty much your microbiome's established. Um, it's, we're going to talk a little bit about the concept of um, stability and resilience, but for the most part, you have a set microbiome, and that microbiome is in part affected through all of your experiences up to your, up through puberty. And then once you have it, it's very difficult and very hard to change that microbiome, but it is possible. So we actually shape the composition. So as an adult, stress, overuse of antibiotics, Overnutrition, not undernutrition in America, it's overnutrition. Um, living with pets and hygiene all impact the microbiome. So, people who tend to use a lot of antibiotics, and there's been studies showing that a repeated use of a Z pack actually does change that stable population of your microbiome slightly. But that slight change increases a type of bacteria called proteobacteria that are unhealthy bacteria. And so that shift is called something that we call a dysbiosis. When your, when your microbiome shifts in composition, in location, or function. And all of these sort of things that we do to ourselves in our, in our modern world um, we have all impacts our microbiome. Sometimes it's just for a short instant, like if you go to have McDonald's after this, Yes, your microbiome is going to change a little bit. If you eat McDonald's every day, your microbiome is going to change much more permanently. So it does shift back and forth. There's even studies showing that your microbiome when you wake up is different from your microbiome at night. So even there's diurnal sort of shifts of your microbiome, which makes it really interesting to study because uh, you can't control people or their habits. Um, so you might hear this term dysbiosis, and I always think it's good to talk about this um, because people use dysbiosis only as far as composition goes. So that's what we've talked about, where you have um, a sort of set microbiome, and then you do something that changes it. So you go from this sort of healthy microbiome here to one where just this yellow bacteria survives. And that shift in those bacterial populations is called 
compositional shift, and that's a dysbiosis. But you can also have something called a functional shift, which is the purpose of those bacteria. So the bacteria can change their genes, turn them on and off, much faster than we can. They adapt very well. So you take a bacteria that's used to eating from a vegan, so you take a bacteria from a vegan and you put it into a carnivore, that bacteria is going to start producing some different metabolic or me metabolites and have some different function in order to survive. And that change in its genetics, that sort of trying to survive in that environment, is a different in its function, okay? And then you have something called a dysbiosis that affects location. And my graphics are taking forever, okay. Um, and this is what they know, and, and where this is important is we know in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, you have more bacteria that actually become mucosal associated. So again, here we go with mucus. Everybody has this nice thick layer of mucus that separates the microbiome from our intestinal cells. In patients with IBD, that intestinal, that mucus layer is sort of broken down and you have much more bacteria that become adjacent to your, your cells, which means they're stimulating them, and which means it's giving them opportunity to translocate and get into the periphery. So that sort of change in site going from up here to mucosal associated is a dysbiosis, and that's a dysbiosis of location. So you have all these things that can happen that can change your microbiome. But the one good thing is that the microbiome is stable and it's also resilient. And so here we have two examples of a microbiome where you have a small perturbation, like an infection that's treated with an antibiotic on your left side. And so after the antibiotics withdrawn, you see that the microbiome goes back to very much what it was before. Um, this is normal. You might have small shifts that don't really mean too much in the grand scheme of things, but all of our bacteria, there's overlapping function. There's redundancy in what they produce and what they do. So sort of a small shift is not so bad for us. Now, what happens in the other situation is if you have a chronic or a continuous perturbation, which this is calling it a press perturbation, but let's say you change your diet completely. You go from being a carnivore to a vegetarian. That's going to shift your microbiome, and you have a, a, a period where the, it's in flux, which is this middle period, but then you go to a new stable state. So you sort of reset your microbiome, and now that's your resilient microbiome. That's the one that's more stable. So you can kind of offset these. You can make these microbiomes more stable with really hammering the system. And I think diet is the best example of that in antibiotic use, because really the, the, our diets can really, are really not that great for most people, and that really changes the bacteria because it's what they eat and what they feed off of. So, um, so what happens in a bad dysbiosis is that you tend to get the same sort of bad guys that start to really edge out or sort of compete the good for space from the good bacteria. So you have bacteria called Clostridium, which we talked about, Streptococcus, Klebsiella. I'm going to quiz you on all these bacteria at the end, so make sure you know them. Um, and then we have our good guys on the other side. And so it's always trying to maintain this balance because we always have some good and some bad bacteria, but we really don't want it to tip the scales so that we have a dysbiosis that's permanent and also in the bad sort of arm of things. And so I am no means an expert on spinal cord injury, but I thought I would um, kind of do a little brief introduction here about what has been known um, as far as the microbiome and spinal cord injury. And so they've done a studies where they've looked at the lesions that are either in the upper or lower areas, and they have shown pretty much some similar things. And uh, they showed that these lesions can cause a decrease in motility um, or paralysis, which leads to constipation, sometimes incontinence or fecal impaction as far as these lesions go. So you can imagine that our intestines are constantly trying to move things through. And that if you start to have differences in transit time of food uh, substances or you start to get stagnation there, then th that's going to be an environment that other bacteria might be able to bloom in better or might be able to colonize or, or feed off of a, a substrate just a little bit longer. And that can cause ultimately a dysbiosis. Um, in the lower lesions, again, you still have decreased motility in the left colon, um, sometimes flaccid paralysis and also constipation incontinence. And so these sort of, and my point in putting this up is that sort of connection to motility and, and normal flow of, um, of, uh, of fecal matter is really important in maintaining health of the intestine. Um, and when you start to get differences or things that affect that motility, it can lead to a dysbiosis.
So <coughs> there's two, mo two papers I just wanted to quickly emphasize. One's a mouse model um, where they found, and this was actually very interesting, is that they found that the gut composition pre-injury actually has an effect on the outcome of spinal cord injury. So this, um, th what they did was they treated the mice with antibiotics, so they wiped out their resident microbiome, and then they gave the, um, this injury, which I, I can't remember how they injured it, but I think Rena might go over that, hopefully. Um, and uh, that, can, that sort of shift, meaning how your microbiome is before injury could affect the outcome, they saw that. But they also saw that injury in and of itself increases the gut permeability. So that means that it allows uh, more inflammation and that it allows the microbiome to start to um, translocate and get systemic, uh, probably due to decreases in mucus, to this increase in transit time, and that that obviously causes a worse outcome in these patients or these mice. Um, but feeding a probiotic reduced that permeability, and that's one thing probiotics do, and we're going to talk about that. Um, in a human study, they found that a reduction in butyrate, um, which is a chemical called a short-chain fatty acid, actually, um, so if they reduce the bacteria that promotes this butyrate, they found that, or they found a reduction in patients. So basically what happened was this really good metabolite that we need to have health in our intestines went away. So this is just a depiction of what I just explained. So here you have no treatment or mice that received antibiotics and then injury, and what they saw was that the mice receiving the antibiotics pre-injury had um, locomotor recovery was more significantly impaired, as well as exacerbated lesion pathology and an increase in intraspinal inflammation. Um, if they gave <coughs> the mouse an injury, they found also altered microbiota composition leading to increased gut permeability and increased inflammation. But however, if they treat that mouse with probiotics, they were able to reduce those phenotypes. So again, meaning that potentially probiotics are beneficial with, um, for, for this. Um, this is a depiction of the human study. So here you have pre-injury, we have healthy butyrate that's pr in suppressing inflammation, producing gut hormones that help the brain, increasing mucus production. And then spinal cord injury, post-injury, what you have is a dysbiosis with a loss of those butyrate-producing bacteria leading to inflammation, bacteria in the bloodstream, and more um, inflammatory uh, phenotype. So should you be taking a probiotic? So more than 40 diseases have actually been linked to bacterial imbalance. These include depression, arthritis, IBS, and cancer. So how does, what would, would taking a probiotic do for you? Well, it can protect you through um, preventing disease-causing bacteria and viruses. So it's been shown to actually help prevent cancer as well as decrease toxins. Um, it helps with absorption of minerals and fatty acids. It helps produce those short-chain fatty acids, which are really important for our immune function. It modulates antibody responses in your immune cells, and it promotes the suppression or it decreases inflammation. And it also helps promote motility, permeability, um, as well as bile and gastric secretion. So it seems great. They're really... Um, beneficial thing. I always <laughs> forget to change the slide, and I think I was thinking about cake when I was making the slide because there's no reason for it to have <laughs> to be here, but I just like <laughs> it's colorful. Um, so these are sort of the diseases proven to benefit from probiotics. So infectious diarrhea. Uh, so basically, studies have shown that probiotics can actually reduce the phenotype or the symptoms in these diseases, which are infectious diarrhea, IBS antibiotic-associated diarrhea, a weakened immune system, eczema, ulcerative colitis, anxiety, depression, and cholesterol. And so how do they work? Well, the first thing that, that probiotics can do is they can antagonize or prevent other bacteria from colonizing your intestine. When you have an infection, if you eat a hamburger with E. coli, that E. coli has to get through all of your gut bacteria to the mucus to be able to penetrate and to have an impact. So by having a really healthy layer of good bacteria, it basically causes um, or it prevents, it's like a big barrier. And those bad bacteria have to somehow fight all of your probiotic bacteria to get to your cells. And that's called um, colonization resistance or antagonism. Um, probiotics can also do something called immune modulation. And that means they can induce a state of anti-inflammation by impacting the immune system, and that produces chemicals called IL-10 or TGF-beta, and those suppress the inflammatory environment. And that's something, and that's been a very well-documented fact um, as far as probiotics go. Um, an exclusion sort of 
this is where it can promote the formation of the tight junctions, uh, which is what keep your immune, your epithelial cells together and prevents bacteria from getting into our bodies. So <clears throat> these are some of the mechanisms that it works. And this is just another slide, if I haven't hammered it home yet, um, all of the ways uh, that uh, probiotics can work. So, you know, they've done a number of studies proving all of these things. Um, <clears throat> this is just an example of how probiotics strengthen our barrier um, as far as um, digesting or breaking down carcinogens um, so that these carcinogens can't cause uh, mutations in our DNA leading to cancer. So are probiotics safe? What I tell everybody is I think that you shouldn't start taking probiotics seriously unless you talk to your doctor about it. Even though you can buy them over the counter, even though they're not regulated by the FDA, if you have a condition or you have um, something that you think is, is, is not right, you should definitely talk to your doctor about adding probiotics to your regimen. Um, this is especially important if you have immune deficiencies or you have uh, treatment for cancer. Now, people with short bowel syndrome, they shouldn't have probiotics because their whole um, intestinal tract is kind of altered by having a shortened bowel, and they can get something called bacterial overgrowth, um, which could be induced by taking a probiotic. So that's a condition that is a bad, uh, you don't want to take probiotics. But for the most part, they are considered safe. Um, the F FDA does not monitor probiotics, so we have to be careful. There's a lot of variation in batch to batch in the different products. And so I'll talk, and there's also mismarketing that you can see. So when you go to look for a probiotic, what should you do? So when you see on the label a bacteria name and all of this sort of jargon, what this is is just the bacteria's name. So there's, we name bacteria like their first name and their last name. So Lactobacillus ruteri, this is a specific bacteria called ruteri, but it's underneath or it's from the family sort of Lactobacillus. So um, anything that's Lactobacillus gasseri, Lactobacillus casei, all are, are, are Lactobacilli. This is just how we differentiate those little differences between the species. And then this gamish of numbers that makes no sense after it is just what we call strain level. So that's a very specific type of L. ruteri. So um, I don't have a good analogy, which I should have come up with one, but if you think about um, a family, this is sort of as you get more and more specific within. So you go from this sort of uh, broad group to a specific member to you know even more spe specific. So that's what those things mean or those labels mean. But you should be paying attention to the number of organisms that is contained in a single dose. So here in one capsule, you have all of these bacteria. So bifido, bifidum, lactobacillus acidophilus, lactobacillus rhamnosus, bifido brevet, and it goes on, and each one of those in one dose is uh, 15 billion, 6 billion, 2.7 billion, 1.5 billion. So it adds up to 30 billion bacteria that you're taking in one dose, right? Remember, more is not always better in some cases. Um, you, should also, um, you should also pay attention to when you should take it. So what they say and what's best is that you um, should take it right after eating. So don't take it before or during your meal. You should take it 30 minutes after because that's when the stomach acids in your, in your stomach are lowest and it will help promote the survival of the bacteria. Because if you think about it, these lactobacilli or these probiotics have to go through your whole digestive tract to get to your colon where that's where we want them to be. Um, and so the higher the amount of stomach acid, the more, um, the more likely they are to, to be killed. And so I think it's always uh, recommended to, you should pick one or probiotic that has seven strains and at least five billion CFU of each of those uh, strains. And that's a good starting point. And this was recommended by um, a website and I, I should have listed it here, but I can't remember it now. But I think that that's a good spot, place to start. Um, you should also pay attention to how the probiotic should be stored. So sometimes <clears throat> you find them in the freezer or the refrigerator rack. Sometimes you find them dry. Uh, on the shelf. One thing is good is keeping them in a dark, cool space and keep them away from moisture and heat. So these are bacteria. Um, they're going to be sensitive to moisture and heat. You also don't want things like fungus growing on them, <laughs> like if they become moist. You don't want uh, them to become contaminated through other, other bacteria that are not meant to be ingested. So keep them um, in a refrigerator is always a good place for them. That keeps them dry and, and, and uh, not moist. <clears throat> 
you should also look to see that they say, it will say either one of these two things, viable through the end of shelf life or viable at the time of manufacture. So what this means is that the probiotic, if it's the first one, it means as long as that probiotic is under its expiration date, there's, those bacteria are alive. The second one means once it leaves that company, they don't know what happens, okay? And so it's always better to get viable through the end of shelf life rather than the viable at the end time of manufacture. I had no idea about this when I went to put this lecture together, but it's actually a very important um, thing that I never paid attention to. You can also pay attention to what kind of pills or the route that they take. So encapsulated pills or other delayed rupture technology ensure that the bacteria survive the acidity of the stomach and can reach your colon. Um, these probiotic waters where you snap the top and it drops the bacteria in the water and you drink it, I don't know what happens to those bacteria. I bet they don't make it through your esophagus, actually. Um, but at least having it in a capsule uh, will provide it um, uh, more assurance that it will get through you. Also, any certification, certification by an in independent third party is important. So the Food and Drug Administration does not regulate probiotics. Therefore, the amount of bacteria stated on the label might not actually be what's actually in that probiotic capsule. So consumer reports will go through and they actually will plate the bacteria. They'll tell you what types of bacteria are in it um, and they'll report this on a website. So looking for something that says independently certified NSF or some sort of certification means that that probiotic is 1.7 billion and it's the bacteria that are listed and that you're not taking something that you shouldn't be taking or a dose much lower than what they say. And so the, one of the last few slides I want to go through is that they're not all created equal. So we lump probiotics together as a probiotic, but these are bacteria with very different functions. So we have bifidobacteriums, lactobacilli. Um, so here are two different members of bifido, longum versus bifidum, and they do very different things. These bacteria are specialized at boosting immunity and preventing pathogens and production of vitamins, whereas bifido longum supports liver function, reduces inflammation, and removes toxins. So, you know, knowing sort of what you want out of your probiotic is helpful. And a lot of times we don't know what we want out of our probiotic. So that's why we say take seven different strains to cover the sort of gamut here that is presented. But this slide is mostly just to show you that these bacteria do have different effects. And that's why you want um, a probiotic with multiple different bacteria present. Um, I just always like to remind people that the human microbiome market is expected to reach 60, 658 million by 2023, um, from 2 294 million in 2019. So this is growing at a rate of 22.3%, which means people are trying to market this and do anything they can to get people to buy microbiome products. And so very few studies have actually told us if probiotics are very, very effective. There's there's studies out there that show that they can have some impact on specific diseases, um, but what, they're, what we're finding is that it's very specific for individuals. So your history as a human being has been very different from my history as a human being, and so my bacteria are tailored towards me and my lifestyle, and your bacteria are tailored towards you and your lifestyle. The same probiotics might not work for me, but it could be wonderful for you. And so I think that we are learning in science that we're going to have to try more tailored um, my probiotics for people um, down the, or currently. And there were two studies published this year in Cell that promoted or basically said that probiotics didn't work for everybody, but they worked really well for some people. And so again, it just says it's just testing out the different probiotics and seeing which ones work for you. So the problems with probiotics are that they're not effective. Uh, because they don't ensure that they get through the stomach acids. They're not natural, so these are a lot of processed foods with too much sugar in them anyway, like yogurt, so we have to be really careful about that. And they're not potent, so 50% of all products don't contain the actual type or number of bacteria that they say they do. So that's why checking uh, the consumer reports is important. Pasteurization kills probiotics, so if you're doing anything where the, the active cultures are done before pasteurization, they're dead <laughs> because they're not doing anything for you. You have to make sure that the, the bacteria are added after pasteurization. And so that's a very uh, distinct thing that you have to look for. So this is the difference between made with live versus avoiding heat treated after culturing. Heat treated after culturing means dead. Not going to do anything for you. So 
in summing up, I just wanted to go over, revisit prebiotics, probiotics, and symbiotics here. So probiotics is like transplanting something into your garden. So you're taking something beautiful and healthy, and you're putting it into your sort of dead garden, <laughs> trying to get it to take root and live. Probiotics is like the fertilizer that feeds the already resident bacteria inside of you. So it's the resources, the food, the fiber, all that will feed all the sort of endogenous healthy bacteria in your guts. And symbiotics are now what they're doing, that's both of these together. So it's taking a probiotic with a prebiotic in order to help it colonize. So these are just some foods that are really great that provide both pre and probiotics. Um, kefir, kombucha, sauerkraut, anything fermented has prebiotics and probiotics in them. Uh, tempeh, lassi, all these sort of things are good for your diet. So fermented food is good. The last thing I wanted to say was um, a, an alternative to probiotic supplements could be fecal transplants. And so this is actually how it's done sometimes, where they blend your stool and they take a healthy person's stool and they give it to somebody who's sick. And this has been really wonderful in, for C. difficile patients because those patients have no recourse other than antibiotics to try to kill the C. diff. And it's, antibiotics are only 50% effective whereas a fecal transplant from a healthy donor is 95% effective with C. difficile patients. Using that, we're really scrambling now to do fecal transplants in every disease possible. Um, and these clinical trials, again, are going the way the probiotic clinical trials went years ago, in that we're getting various results. People don't know a lot about how to do a good fecal transplant. So this slide, you can review it at your leisure, shows all of the different questions that you have to ask yourself when you're designing a fecal transplant. So fresh or frozen, who's the donor? Aerobic or anaerobic? Should the person be on antibiotics before the fecal transplant? Nobody knows any of these questions, answers these questions, and so um, that's why I think we're getting this sort of um, mixed reviews with fecal transplants. And so lastly, the future of probiotic supplements, I find this really interesting, is something called lactoceuticals. Um, this is using fermentation process uh, with different types of food to promote lactobacillus. And now they're actually making genetically modified lactobacilli that produce in anti-inflammatory molecules and things like that to suppress the immune system. So this is the Center for Microbiome Sciences and Therapeutics. This is the center that, is, um, the, that I was brought here to direct at the University of Washington. It's really uh, made to advance the understanding of this interaction between the microbiome and our own cells, and really to drive discovery of therapeutics that could be used to manipulate the microbiome in order to be a therapy for different diseases. We really try to interact with clinicians, and one goal of the, the center is to really help clinicians in clinical studies um, so that we have more human-based therapies and human-based studies to go on and not just animal work. We also have an art and science program that is really something that's close to my heart, which is a way to educate and inspire the community about the microbiome and diet and nutrition. These are sort of the diseases that we're working on right now with the different clinicians that we're working with, but we have a very strong inflammatory bowel disease um, group and HIV, looking at um, HIV infection in Africa in Kenyan infants, as well as a, a whole lot of diet and nutrition studies. And then this is our uh, Vivo Art, which is our art science program, which takes um, artists and put them in the lab for a little bit and sees what happens, basically. So um, with that, I'm going to hand the microphone to the next speaker. And thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks again for sticking around for this part of the talk. This gets a little bit technical. I don't have the fun graphic slides that uh, Dr. DePaolo has, but we'll do our best. So you've just heard uh, a really good story um, about how there's been growing recognition that the human microbiome actually has a lot of influence on human health. And now we're going to switch gears a little bit and focus on what this sort of line of research has shown with regard to spinal cord injury health. Okay. Uh, many of the health conditions that scientists like Dr. DePaolo have actually identified as being under microbial influence um, actually occur in spinal cord injury in spades, right? It's quite common that uh, there are multiple medical conditions that would, would, uh, would result from spinal cord injury, affecting the bowel, the bladder, skin health, weight management, that sort of thing, immunity. These are all things that have been shown to be influenced strongly by the microbiome. Um, there's another reason this is really relevant to spinal cord injury. 
we've sort of recognized um, that, that there is this condition called gut dysbiosis that occurs that Dr. DePaolo had um, discussed, where as we um, treat um, with antibiotics, that you can actually give rise to antibiotic resistant organisms, and sometimes organisms resistant to multiple different antibiotics, and that the more we treat, um, there is also an increased risk for C. difficile um, colitis, um, which was discussed earlier as well. Um, and so, you know, you think about someone with a spinal cord injury and their lifetime and how many times they usually will end up getting treated with antibiotic courses because of infections of um, the bladder, skin, um, et cetera, respiratory function, uh, respiratory health. So at this big, the question is, the, the condition of gut dysbiosis, sort of an irregularity of the microbiome of, uh, of the gut, really an inevitable condition in spinal cord injury. And what is the role then of probiotics in improving spinal cord injury health? So I think as, as we explore what literature does and does not exist to support um, this idea, there are three areas that I wanted to review that are noteworthy um, research. Um, in this area. One is with regard to neurogenic bladder, neurogenic bowel, and neuroprotection and neural recovery. And you've heard a little bit of the, about those studies today. What is the state of the science? We're going to review this. And I would say that the, the, the research fa falls along two different lines. One is trying to even define what the microbiome looks like in a particular organ system in someone who has a spinal cord injury. And the second is actually doing probiotic interventions to see if it's helpful um, in spinal cord injury related conditions. So those are the two categories you're going to hear instead of a common theme. So really when you look at the papers that have been published in this area, it wasn't until this, this decade that there was um, a really good characterization and attempt to define what the microbiome actually looks like in the bladder, for instance, of someone who has a neurogenic bladder because of a spinal cord injury. And uh, there's a group from uh, National Rehab um, Hospital, Dr. Suzanne Groa and her colleagues who have actually published two papers. Um, and they looked at 47 people, volunteers, 24 of whom had a neurogenic bladder and 23 did not. Um, all of them, interestingly, had no symptoms whatsoever of urinary tract infection. They were all healthy, completely asymptomatic. And they then looked at uh, did DNA analysis of their urine, and then also did the typical studies we would run to check if someone had a, had a urinary tract infection. They do a urinalysis and a urine culture to see if any bacteria grew. And um, what they did was they did the study originally in 2012, and then as, as technology progresses and there's new sort of pipelines of information and platforms to analyze DNA with, they were actually able to um, redo the study with the same um, uh, information that they already had from the subjects that they had from several years ago and actually drill it down even further, not just to the genus level, as you heard about sort of the family tree, but down to the species level. So it got even more specific. And what they found was that the urine microbiome in someone who, um, so whether or not you had a spinal cord injury, actually showed differences according to gender and the bladder function. So let's discuss that. The first finding is that all of the samples, 100% of them, whether they were, uh, had a neurogenic bladder or not, actually had bacteria in it by DNA analysis. So this has essentially debunked this common um, uh, sort of idea that people had that the urine is sterile uh, in healthy conditions. Only 23 of those people, um, and it's not people who had neurogenic bladder versus not, it was 23 of them actually had a positive urine culture as opposed to all of the samples actually having um, uh, evidence of bacteria by DNA analysis, suggesting that the DNA analysis actually had better sensitivity in detecting bacteria in the urine. The most commonly found organism is E. coli. And again, as we sort of take gasp when we hear about E. coli on our bodies because we hear such bad press about it, it can cause very significant disease. Um, but there is resident E. coli that clearly in people who have absolutely no symptoms and are otherwise healthy. What was interesting is that in um, people who did not have a neurogenic bladder, women in particular had a higher proportion of this lactobacillus species. And that's commonly found in the vaginal tract in women. And this particular type of lactobacillus, um, crispatus, is generally associated with good health. Um, men had a higher proportion of other um, uh, organisms. 
none of the names you have to remember necessarily. But again, the take home point here is that urine is actually not sterile. And we'll talk about the implications of this um, finding. The second is an interesting finding in that women with neurogenic bladder in particular had a very different lactobacillus community than women who did not have neurogenic bladder. In fact, they had complete absence of that particular lactobacillus crispatus that we just discussed was quite common in women who did not have neurogenic bladder. And instead, they had a different um, type of uh, called lactobacillus inners, which in the general population was associated with having sort of greater potential for disease, so it's not less healthy state. Wh what the clinical implication of having this in, in the urine, we don't really know at this point in time. We haven't kind of made that, um, sort of breached that gap to really understand what the clinical implications of these findings are. The third finding is that regardless of gender, people with neurogenic bladder had a greater proportion of certain bacteria that people without neurogenic bladders um, didn't have. So Enterococcus, Klebsiella, um, in addition to E. coli. And if you remember, these are bacteria that are generally thought of as unhealthy bacteria. They're not the good bacteria necessarily. But we know now that people can have this just residing and not causing any kind of disease or illness in the host. Um, and p people with neurogenic bladders in particular can have this as just resident organisms as part of their microbiome. Um, Interestingly as well, they found a somewhat unusual species called um, acto, uh, actinobaculum, or genus, I suppose, um, that they found only by DNA analysis. Apparently, this is a very um, picky organism that it can be hard to grow in a lot of um, uh, aerobic or sort of aerated conditions, which might, might be why it was more difficult to find. All of the people who grew that particular organism had high white blood cell count in the urine. And so we'll talk about that later. Now that study looked at a single point in time. It's called a cross-sectional um, study. They looked at a single point in time, all comers, in terms of what the bacteria looked like. What uh, other researchers did was to try and, and discover what happens to that urine microbiome over time with people who have a neurogenic bladder. Uh, and they fo followed people, three subjects, so a very sort of small uh, group of individuals as part of a larger study that's still ongoing and unpublished, um, who had, who used chronic catheterization of some kind. Um, and they followed them over time as probiotics were actually administered. And they found that they all, all three of them had very unique microbiomes, which we kind of expect to some degree. And that um, the composition, the pr proportion of organisms changed uh, so one, one particular proportion of, uh, would rise right before the clinical diagnosis of a urinary tract infection. And so people are now beginning to wonder, can we use this as a marker to predict um, impending disease? We don't really, we haven't, it's still a stretch to kind of make that claim, but it's sort of an intriguing finding now um, if you're able to predict the onset of disease. And as Dr. DePaolo mentioned, that resident community of organisms was highly resilient. So even though you can change it temporarily with the administra administration of probiotics, it would naturally revert back into the, the um, natural state of uh, the community. So we go back to the same proportions. There are also some interesting, rather unusual um, and rarely found organisms um, that, were, that are typically associated with a very severe illness. Um, that were found in another individual recently in a case report that actually suggested that uh, in both the healthy and, and disease states that suggest that, again, there are these bacteria that are typically thought of as bad bacteria and disease-causing pathogenic bacteria that actually existed in a healthy state in individuals with spinal cord injury. So what are the implications of this, of this discovery? First of all, we know that healthy urine has a, has a resident bacterial community and that having a neurogenic bladder leads to a very different microbial community in the host with a spinal cord injury. And it's essentially redefined um, what we think of as healthy urine. Um, and when, when rehab physicians, spinal cord injury physicians in particular, try to drive home the message that you should not ever be overtreated for what is thought to be a um, uh, urinary tract infection, the reason for that is they want to avoid the development of um, uh, highly resistant organisms in the urine. But we now have literature that suggests that 
attaining sterile urine is actually not the goal anymore. That it, ideally we can select which is the culprit and kind of target our treatment towards that um, if possible. And that now we know that uh, there's always bacteria in urine even in healthy individuals. We also know now that high uh, levels of white blood count um, in the urine may not necessarily mean that you have an active illness or disease or a urinary tract infection. And so, um, uh, and although this is not an absolute phenomenon, we might actually consider a high white count with a certain clinical scenario as being indicative of a urinary tract infection. It's no longer so absolute. And so when uh, federal regulatory bodies were sort of are, are pushing hospital systems to eliminate these catheter-associated UTIs, also known as CAUDIs. Um, this has led to a lot of, um, of hospital systems sort of prematurely removing catheters in individuals who have spinal cord injury and neurogenic bladder, and, um, and it may not even be necessary. And they're really trying to prevent urinary tract infections by using um, a, a diagnostic category of having high white blood count as an indication that there might actually be a urinary tract infection. That may no longer be true, and we shouldn't actually abide by that in people who have neurogenic bladder. So what, what if we actually could find a way to target the microbiome and regulate it, manipulate it in some way, so that we can actually reduce the risk of urinary tract infections? So people actually explored that. Um, by looking at something called, uh, something called bacterial interference. So the technical definition of this is using bacteria of low virulence, low ability to cause actual bad disease, to compete and protect against colonization and infection by disease-causing organisms. And so you're really trying to, to um, potentially uphold and stabilize your, your line of defense using good bacteria to prevent the, the disease-causing organisms from uh, opportunistically sort of taking over and causing disease. Does that make sense to folks? And so there's passive interference where you just don't treat bacteria that don't seem to be causing a problem and that sort of maintaining that community of organisms seems to be protective for the host. They've shown this in individual studies of people, who, young people in particular, who have organisms and don't seem to have any signs or symptoms of UTI and not treating it was actually protective for these individuals. And there's active interference where we actually deliberately try and introduce benign bacteria, low virulent bacteria, to re prevent colonization and overtake by disease-causing bacteria. And this is sort of the latter, the active interference is where um, a lot of the research is going. So how does, what are the possible cellular level mechanisms that, um, that underlie bacterial interference and probiotics and why they would theoretically work? So there are many thoughts. One is that they might be competing for nutrients for food. Um, the next is that they might be competing for actual binding sites at their sort of their target cells. And I think of it as kind of like musical chairs. There are only so many chairs, and everyone sort of tries to grab a seat before the music ends. There are sort of competition for binding sites for organisms as well. Um, the bacteria themselves might, might actually secrete uh, a substance that is that would kill off others in their species. Um, they might modulate the immune system. They might um, influence how the genes function. And they might actually disrupt biofilm, which is sort of a film of bacteria that can form on the surface um, of, a, of a product, like a catheter, for instance. So probably the name that's been associated the most with bacterial interference for uh, urinary tract infections is Darush and, um, and Hull. I hope I'm not I'm saying their name correctly. But they actually. Um, had a series of studies that started with very simple um, uh, studies, and then it, they tried to really improve the rigor of these studies over time. But the earlier studies, studies were very promising um, um, at preventing urinary tract infection. At least this is what they have reported. So what is their protocol? So what they decided was that they needed to somehow colonize the, the bladder with good bacteria. And so they chose an E. coli um, that was more benign, and they put it in a solution. They treated all the volunteers with antibiotics for five to seven days, just not to get it sterile, but to kind of give the new organisms a leg up on the process. And they would instill through a catheter, clamp it off, leave it for about an hour, maybe repeat it, and they did this for three days. 
Um, and what they were watching for was the bladder getting colonized with this particular E. coli organism. And they had a way of testing for that. If for some reason it didn't take, they would repeat that up to three times until it did, or consider people non-responders, um, not colonizable. Um, and the earlier reports were that there was a rather significant reduction in the frequency of urinary tract infections. Um, they considered people invaluable, meaning that they could use their data to be studied if they remain colonized for at least a month, and they would actually start taking urine samples and checking them every month for a year. So it's, uh, there was an attempt to really uh, try and define, answer the question as to whether probiotics could help reduce urinary tract infections. So this is, I don't have the cool graphics that Dr. DePaola has, but um, you know, they had 59 subjects out of the, the pool of people who were volunteering, and 49 of them received this E. coli infusion. Um, 15 got the control, which is really sort of a, their equivalent of a placebo, which is just saline, just salt water. Um, and then they studied to see if they were um, colonized, and if so, then they would sort of collect all of their data. If they weren't, they would keep repeating it for up to three times. And here's where I think the, the study got criticized. If they were still not colonized after essentially four cycles of this, they, they basically did not report any of their findings. So whether they didn't study them or just didn't report them was un, not quite clear. So what did they find? So first of all, they had very limited success with actually getting colonization, only 38%. Um, this was in contrast to the earlier studies, which were like in the 62, 68% range uh, with greater success. They don't, they, it wasn't really clear why that was the case. Um, there might be, have something to do with the fact that a lot of people dropped off of the study. We'll talk about that here in a second. What was particularly interesting to me, and probably can be explored, potentially in future studies to see if this uh, rings true, is that none of the women who had a spinal cord injury um, s achieved successful colonization. And I, that was never explained. We're not really clear as to why that is the case. They did, again, report a decrease in uh, urinary tract infections. You can kind of see the rates here. The number of people who had uh, at least one UTI in the following year was 29% in the study group versus 70% in people who received just the saline. An average UTIs per year lower, 0 0.5 versus 1.68. Um, and this seemed to um, mirror earlier findings. They also seem to report reasonably good protocol safety. Uh, as it was administered and as described and reported, there were no urinary tract infections that were actually attributed to that particular strain of E. coli. Um, and there were some earlier studies they had done where no one developed systemic infection where it kind of seeped into their bloodstream and made people very ill. One person had autonomic dysreflexia, but I actually think it was one of the people in the control group. And one had a completely unrelated urinary tract infection. But here was the rub. There was very, ultima ultimately, there was very poor acceptance of the protocol. Um, people just didn't find it practical. They didn't really want to stay. So there was a huge dropout rate, if you think about um, you know, essentially half of the group dropped out um, and were not evaluated and therefore um, uh, not reportable. So the large dropout rate um, reduces the quality of the data and the analysis of the data. So a similar study was done with a slightly different design called a crossover design where at the end of the treatment period people crossed over in the other group and got the other treatment that the other group had received. So, but Essentially, to summarize, had similar findings in terms of um, uh, reducing the frequency with which urinary tract infections were reported in, in, in the follow-up period, and reported a longer time before someone actually had their first UTI after the procedure, and general safety sort of indicated that no kidney infections ensued from this treatment. So as, if, you think, if you think about, there are many ways to try and uh, come to um, affect bacterial interference. And the protocol for installation was just so impractical and unacceptable to most of the subjects. What about a more local approach? What if you um, actually took the catheter that was going to be used and impregnated that and used that to colonize the, the, the bladder? So people actually did this because they tested it on a catheter and found that if they used the same E. coli that the other um, group had used and colonized it, that no matter what pathogenic organism they would throw on an entire array of it, that these organisms wouldn't take to the catheter. So they said, well, let's try this. 
So they stuck a Foley catheter, the tip of it, in, in a solution. They immersed it for 48 hours, and the solution had this particular strain of E. coli. And, um, and then they um, looked for successful colonization and looked at urinary tract infection frequency. And similarly, they were also reporting a drop in UTI uh, rates. Um, they also demonstrated how this could be done for individuals who had, were using intermittent catheterization. They would place a catheter for three days and do the installation during, uh, over that three-day period. But wait. How strong is the evidence? So in current medical practice and in training, we teach everyone to really look critically at the literature and not just to accept at face value the way it was reported, um, even though it's quite promising and, and, and impressive results. So Cochrane is an organization whose mission is to actually gather, analyze, and summarize for the public the best evidence. Um, and so they, they will only select um, data from studies that were designed, in their opinion, very well, and they're actually going to pull that data, analyze it for any particular bias or weaknesses, and they'll report out to the community what they think the effect of that intervention was. So if you're ever interested in trying to find out if an intervention you're curious about um, might be helpful, you can always look uh, and do a search online for a Cochrane review. So the Cochrane uh, review was published last year looking at this particular evidence for bacterial inter, um, interference for urinary tract infections. And only selected three. And they were the three that, they're, they're, some of them were the studies that we just discussed. And their conclusion was there was an extremely high risk of bias based on how the data was um, reported and collected and analyzed. And, and ultimately felt that the, um, uh, that they really, was, it was very uh, low quality evidence that they could not uh, conclude with any certainty whatsoever whether probiotic installation actually helped prevent urinary tract infection in people with spinal cord injury. So where does that le leave us with regard to this? So there are certainly intriguing and important first steps in trying to sort of piece this puzzle together. It certainly highlights the areas of challenge um, in this type of research, especially for a small population. Um, Clearly, whoever decides to do this needs to think about the practicality of the protocol. And perhaps there's a way to investigate with uh, another study in the future how to practically inoculate someone with, um, with uh, uh, good bacteria um, with more rigorous methodology to improve the credibility of their findings. What about the, the bowel? So I think you've heard about this a little bit. Same principle, there are people who are trying to define the microbiome in a state with spinal cord injury in a particular organ system, and then there are people who are trying to do intervention with probiotics. So the attempt by Gongor to define the microbiota of the neurogenic bowel uh, using DNA analysis revealed, as you just heard, that there's less bacteria that produce butyrate. Well, we know that butyrate has really strong effects on all of these things, inflammation, um, immune function, uh, people have even suggested pain management. Um, and so this reduction in butyrate producing bacteria is rather a significant finding, but it's still quite a leap to make, uh, to really make any assumptions, even though you would logically think, well, a relative decline in that population might mean that someone is in a less healthy state or at greater risk for these problems. But we actually don't have data to show that quite yet. But it's sort of an intriguing finding. And as, um, as was discussed earlier, the, the product Yakult, um, has anyone tried Yakult around here? Okay. For those of us who grew up in Asia, we're very familiar with Yakult. Um, so it, it is a product that was um, developed, as Dr. DePaolo mentioned, that contains lactobacillus um, casei shirota strain. And they used this in people who they knew were going to need antibiotics for, for whatever reason. Didn't matter what type of infection. They gave it for the full period of the antibiotic treatment and seven days after that. And they looked at whether they could find associations with who developed C. diff diarrhea and found that only two associations, those who didn't take probiotic treatment and those who had very poor intake, taking less than 50% of their meal consistently, then were, seemed to have um, greater association with having C. diff diarrhea. Clearly, more rigorous study is needed um, in this um, to sort of su substantiate this. And then um, I think what was discussed earlier is this idea of fecal uh, transplantation and spinal cord injury. You've certainly had a few um, patients 
over time who have had this successfully. There was one case report a few years ago that looked at um, uh, performing this in an individual who really was quite ill from C. diff, recurrent C. diff um, diarrhea. And uh, he had stool transplantation through the col colonoscopy. Uh, he did become extremely sick after this um, and required, unfortunately, more ana antibiotics to treat, um, to treat his illness. And despite this, actually found no relapse of C. diff at the 12-week follow-up mark. So some uh, impressive results, again, in one, one person. And then I, I won't belabor the issue of the microbiota because you've heard about um, how there might be a protective effect and how administering it after the spinal cord injury might actually um, be able to uh, result in uh, better locomotor function, at least in the mi mouse model, um, and, uh, and decrease actually when they looked at slides of the spinal cord cross section showed less volume of a spinal cord injury, the lesion itself actually was impressively smaller. And the data on neuroprotection is still preliminary. It's still in, in a mouse model, right? So we know that manipulation of the gut's microbiome using both probiotics might actually have some therapeutic value, at least in spinal cord injury in mice, and uh, although the mechanism for this remains somewhat unclear. So the burning questions that come from this is, is gut dysbiosis another um, medical complication after spinal cord injury? When you think about all the medical complications that exist, there would be neurogenic bowel, neurogenic bladder, spasticity, pain, um, neuropathic skin, and the potential for pressure injuries. Should we really be listing gut dysbiosis as sort of, uh, sort of a, a complication? Is it inevitable for people to, ha to experience this? We don't really know. Are the gut blad and bladder microbiomes and dysbiosis then suitable new targets for treatment to improve SCI health and function? It seems like the answer would probably be probably uh, yes. And will advancements in characterization and detection of um, individual microbiota, I guess, um, serve, as a, serve in the future as a marker of um, health and disease and actually help inform our clinical decisions? Wouldn't it be great if you, were, you thought you were getting sick that you could submit a urine sample or a stool sample and people can kind of analyze, yeah, you're kind of getting sick and let's preemptively treat you with something. That might be kind of an interesting idea, but uh, a little far-fetched, admittedly. So what are the implications for spinal cord injury? The, the data is intriguing, as I've mentioned over and over, but the quality, of, uh, uh, the good, good quality data remains uh, limited and is still very preliminary. And SCI conditions, however, stand to really benefit significantly from an advancement in this line of research on, on probiotic effects on human health. We recognize there are many challenges and therefore opportunities to study probiotics, but it, in, in uh, the SCI population, really designing something that seems practical would be um, very important along with the high quality of the research. And there must necessarily be translation from an animal model of um, intervention to the humans. So what are our, our recommendations for you? It's a little hard to come up with them since we don't, as you've heard, we don't have uh, very strong data. But I would say learn to love your microbiome <laughs> because you need to defend and feed your microbiome. Um, that, that much we know. And so this, I think, would mean judicious antibiotic use, avoiding overtreatment, appropriate interpretation of the results of any uh, urine culture results, for instance, now that we know that, that healthy urine is actually not uh, sterile. Um, trying to feed the microbiome with prebiotics, which includes products like fiber, um, and find natural pre and probiotic uh, sources. Focus on nutrition, potentially, when you're receiving antibiotic treatment, because that was one of the factors that seemed to be associated with, um, with um, developing C. diff diarrhea. Again, this is, we don't have enough research to prove this, but it's certainly something uh, worth mentioning. And consider probiotics, um, but definitely speak with your medical provider about this. Since we know um, that there is a big push, um, drive in the market to, um, to get you to buy probiotics and related um, microbiome products, Certainly manage your expectations about the health benefits, knowing now what we do or don't know in spinal cord injury. And be curious. Stay informed about the progress in these areas. Look at the literature very critically as much as you can. Uh, so love your microbiome. Just remember what you've heard. Their genetic material outnumbers ours. So. <laughs>
Uh, so I think at this point, um, we'll entertain some questions. Yes, yeah, so the question was, um, what conditions should avoid uh, probiotics, and would you know that you had that? And the answer is yes, it's, it's called short bowel syndrome. You would know that you had that. Um, a lot of times, this is a complication that arises with inflammatory bowel disease. And so uh, definitely, you, you, don't, you would know that you had that. But the question was, would your, if, as we advise people to consult their medical provider, what do medical providers really know about probiotics? So I think admittedly, even for me, this is very difficult information. I wouldn't necessarily consider myself an expert, which is why I'm, I'm speaking with Dr. DePaolo today. But I think they could probably eliminate the, the really high-risk conditions, you know, um, poor immune function, where you would be extreme, somewhat higher risk or maybe shortcut syndrome uh, excluded from uh, being safely able to take it. So I think they would probably be aware of the huge red flag issues, uh, but they may not know the subtle differences with what to look for in a pro uh, probiotic product. And you've heard all of that. You might actually be more expert at this point in time than some of the primary care providers that you're going to see. So the question is, um, what diets are out there that might have some scientific merit that promote gut health and gut function. Um, this is a very complicated uh, question because I think that there's so many different variations on themes and we're now even cycling back to the same diets but with different names for some of these. Um, but you know there's the idea of the microbiome diet which is something that has kind of popped up recently is sort of what we went over today which is eat really in eating those fermented foods the, um, the kefirs, the kimchi, also having a high fiber. We eat so much less fiber than our ancestors, it's ridiculous. I wanna say it's like 250 times less than what our ancestors used to eat. So um, these good bacteria, they feed off of that, uh, that fiber and it, it supports their health. And so by depleting them of their nutrients, it's gonna affect us. So I think those sort of diets where you are not dramatically changing, shifting from one thing to another, because we don't know how that changes. People who do yo-yo diets, and, uh, or yo-yo diets, or, or these fad diets where you drink lemon and cayenne pepper for three days, and, and you basically lose a ton of weight, those have negative consequences on your microbiome. Um, and so, but again, we don't know what yo-yo dieting does, and so I think you have to be cautious. I think moderation is key, and adding fiber and these probiotic and prebiotic supplements and natural foods is the way to go. Yes. Is there a protocol for diagnosis of urinary tract infections that do not need to be treated? That's a great question. I would say that still to this day, we take the clinical picture and correlate that with what we're finding on the labs. I've seen uh, just, just actually this past week, we saw, I saw someone who had um, such significant white cells in their urine that it was actually clumping. That's a rather significant amount. And yet that person really didn't seem that ill from that particular condition. So it's still, you're still trying to find what is sort of uh, normal for that individual and sort of watch that maybe over time to see what seems to be out of range, out of character, and always still look at the clinical condition. And this is where I think it can be hard for um, primary care physicians who see you potentially less frequently, uh, are less familiar with um, asymptomatic bacteria, just having bacteria resident in, in your urine. So I think finding someone who's knowledgeable about neurogenic bladder to kind of help you make that decision about treatment or not. Um, but there are some threshold numbers that we'll follow that have been recommended and we'll follow that. The problem is that a lot of people, especially with chronic catheterization, will have those significant numbers of bacteria and multiple types of organisms in their uh, catheterized urine. So, um, so there's not even a threshold uh, number of white cells that seems meaningful um, because some people just normally live with white cells of, you know, 60, you know, in their urine rather than five. So it's really knowing you over time and following you clinically, I think, is probably the best thing. So I think, I think it is helpful to have that discussion with your primary care provider, especially if they're very unfamiliar with spinal cord injury, that there is a state of asymptomatic bacteria, bacteria just living and not causing disease or illness, um, and avoiding sort of just trying to check the urine because you can't find anything else and it's sort of 
low-hanging fruit to go look for a urinary tract infection than over-treating what's there if there might be potentially another cause. And certainly we don't traditionally recheck urine after antibiotic treatment because we, we're not, we're, our goal is not to look for uh, the absence of bacteria. It's really to look for the absence of clinical um, problems. Yeah, um, so the question is, is there anything or any um, bad or deleterious consequences of taking probiotics just generally for six months if you are pretty typical uh, or you have pretty typical health? And um, I would say when you go to choose a probiotic, I always like to say, say this. Um, if you don't see something happen, and I say output, um, change within or even, you know, it can be your stool consistency or what you're what you're exiting, but also um, your mood or your health, if it doesn't change within two to three weeks, I would say that probiotic's probably not doing it for you. And make sure you write down all the names of the bacteria on the, the label, and then pick a different one with different bacteria and try that. Um, and, it, and that's the best advice that I could give you for that. Um, I don't think it can cause negative consequences in, in, uh, in a sense, um, there have been a couple of studies that have shown that there is, um, that some people are just immune almost <laughs> to, uh, to probiotic use, that some people are just more susceptible to it than others. I think it was like 50% 50, 50 of the, the study um, showed that the, pa the people or the patients were responsive. Um, but mostly you take it in and the probiotic comes out. Um, but we don't know if that transient effect, like the transient passage of your body is impacting your resident gut bacteria to produce something that's beneficial. So I don't think, personally, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. If you start to feel sick, if you start to feel unhealthy, if you start to have cramping, diarrhea, those things, I would immediately stop and go see the doctor um, because there could be something that you're, you've done and you don't realize you've initiated it. So, so the question is, is there a role for checking a baseline urinalysis, a urine sample, when you're feeling healthy and otherwise not sick? I think that's a great idea. I think there's a lot of value, um, particularly in, uh, among primary care providers, to sort of be convinced with the data that people are otherwise well. Um, sometimes for primary care providers, just you being in a chair, having a spinal cord injury can be daunting to them. And meeting you in a healthy state and looking at your data when you're in a healthy state is a good baseline for comparison. Um, that might be quite helpful. So I agree. So one thing I didn't hit on is that we all have very different microbiomes, right? So it's almost like a fingerprint amongst all of us. It's uh, forensic science is now starting to use microbiomes, skin microbiomes, not other microbiomes, skin microbiomes to identify um, criminals and things like that. So I think just knowing what your body produces and what's normal for you is important. And so uh, I think uh, just to follow up, I, I would say yes. I don't know anything about the primary care part of it, but I think just understanding your own physiology is important. 